From the moment we enter school, we were made to believe that our brain's capacity is limited. This is due to the fact that we were also made to believe that we have to go through rote learning in order to memorize a certain lesson. In effect, we only end up cramming information in our head, all of which we forget by the next day. The author wishes to refute that belief. He knows that all of us have unlimited memory, and in order to unleash this hidden ability, we must first learn the various memory methods that all great memory masters use. This book lays down the various methods and systems which will help us maximize our memory. This book aims to open our eyes to the fact that we all possess unlimited memory. The author discussed each chapter in the most comprehensible way possible, complete with examples to help readers visualize how each method works. Our brain's memory is responsible for everything that we are today. The author shares that we are data collecting beings, and the data collected shapes how we learn, think, create, and do other cognitive activities. With this, we can see how amazing our memory can be. However, we are often made to think that as human beings, we are only blessed with limited memory. This book seeks to refute that belief. To understand what this book is trying to convey on a deeper level, we must keep in mind that the human mind has two important properties, learning and memory. Learning is the brain's ability to acquire new information. On the other hand, memory is the one responsible for holding the information in place. Thus, we can now see where the problem lies. If a person's memory cannot hold new information in place, then he is stuck in an endless loop of learning and forgetting. Nonetheless, the author points out that we have two options regarding our memory. The first is to not do anything about it and just accept that our memory cannot be improved. On the other hand, the second option is accepting that our memory is just a habit and that it can be improved through proper training. Unfortunately, most people resort to the first option because traditional schooling does not give them the opportunity to see how amazing their brains are. This book aims to provide us with the basics in order to train and improve our memory. The author guarantees that with continuous practice, we can achieve the same results as those of memory masters. The thought of unlimited memory seems impossible to achieve, but the author believes that each of us has equal potential to master our memory, regardless of age or social status. The author understands that this book will be met with much criticism and negative judgment. He reminds us that judging information is one way to prevent us from learning, therefore blocking our road towards memory and life improvement. In order to fully comprehend the lessons and principles in this book, it is best to read with an open mind. Concentrate. Excuse me. In order to improve our memory, we must first recognize the common excuses we make, which only get in the way of us accomplishing many things such as reading this book to completion. Acknowledging these excuses will help us focus on learning what this book has to offer and eventually improve our concentration. The author has categorized common excuses into the following. 1. Feeling helpless. Excuses under this category include not being smart enough, not having enough time, accepting that our biological makeup hinders us from having good memory, and being too old to learn new things. 2. Blaming someone else. The second set of excuses include being told that we are stupid, requiring support for skills development, and blaming the book. The author shares that blaming others will only leave a negative cloud hovering above us, causing you to block out learning. We must therefore choose to learn instead of placing blame. 3. Reading this book will be stressful. And finally, the last set of excuses includes thinking that the book offers too much to learn, feeling burdened that we have to change the way we think, that it will be difficult, and that the book will require us to do a lot. Assess all these excuses and ask yourself if these excuses are true. People may not realize it yet at this point, but excuses only lead us into living mediocre lives. It stops us from living an amazing life because we already came up with an excuse to avoid the first step. The author also likens these excuses to thought viruses which only impede our memory's capacity to improve. It makes our brain believe that we have limits, and when we believe in these limits, we also set boundaries on how we live our lives. Nonetheless, it all boils down to our choices. As early as now, we must decide to stop giving in to these excuses. 
We must consistently and persistently let go of these excuses and focus on increasing our desire to learn and master the principles stated in this book. After all, we are the only ones responsible for our own learning. To end this chapter, the author shares the following pointers to help us take action and overcome these excuses. 1. Try to imagine what your life would be like in five years if you continue to hold on to your excuses. 2. Try to imagine who you would become if you are no longer bound by these excuses. Maintain this mindset whenever you are trying to learn something and see how much you will improve. 3. Remind yourself that these are all just excuses and they do not represent the truth. Change the way you see these excuses and do it now. 4. Weigh your priorities by asking yourself whether you want to excuse yourself from developing your true potential or be the best person that you can be. 5. List down the reasons why it is important for you to empower your memory. This will help you in creating the big why, which will eventually nudge you to take the first step. Never believe a lie. Our beliefs also play an important role in shaping our memory. According to the author, what we believe is merely a limited version of the truth, a version which we have created on our own. Unfortunately, once we have shaped our beliefs, we tend to defend them. And this is why people who believe that they merely have limited concentration, memory, and potential end up having a hard time learning. To illustrate, the author makes us imagine two persons living on two separate yet identical Earths. Mr. A is living on Earth 1 while Mr. B is living on Earth B. Both men share identical features, attain the same educational level, and even have identical biological composition. The difference, however, lies in the fact that Mr. A believed that he had limited memory. He would often tell people excuses like having a short attention span, being terrible with names, an aging memory, and complaining about receiving too much information that his brain couldn't handle. In effect, he developed an aversion toward learning. On the other hand, Mr. B believed that he had an amazing memory. He would often be heard sharing stories of how great his memory is. He keeps on emphasizing the importance of improving one's memory and would often exclaim that his memory gets better every day. In effect, Mr. B loved learning because he believed that it was a great way to train his mind. Thus, Mr. B had a better memory. The author points out that although the only difference is their beliefs about memory, it has certainly created a big gap between them in terms of learning. From this illustration, we can now see that having empowering beliefs can cause a dramatic impact on our lives. Belief, after all, is a sense of being certain, and this feeling of certainty makes it definitive of who we will become. This provides us with all the more reason to change our beliefs. Fortunately, changing our beliefs is not an impossible feat. The author shares the following steps. 1. Have a reason for the change and stick to it. Remember that 80% of the process lies in why you want to change it, while only 20% is about how you do it. 2. The second step is to actively question your beliefs. The author shares guide questions like, how much would it cost you if you held on to your belief? Is there a good reason to hold on to it? Is your belief the truth? Are you 100% certain that it is the truth? 3. The third step is to create a new belief and confirm it. In confirming your new belief, think of experiences and conduct research. This not only helps you create more meaningful beliefs, but will also help you experience new things and open up to the possibilities. 4. And finally, continuously use your new belief and make it part of your identity. To make the process easier, it is best to keep in mind that your old beliefs stem from the stories that you have come to accept as true. This will help you realize that changing your beliefs can be as simple as changing the stories in your head. Additionally, the author also shares the following core beliefs which we must incorporate into our lives right now. 1. Believe that you were born with exceptional concentration and memory. Human beings are naturally born with great memory, and it does not depend on a unique talent or pills. In order to experience our memory's full potential, we must develop the willingness to learn, self-confidence, and a foolproof method. 2. We must be open to the fact that memory improvement is important. 
Keep in mind that our memory is our brain's most important mental function, so improving it also means improving your life. 3. Believe that you have incredible abilities and that your memory is unlimited. The author shares that simply holding a conversation would require us to listen, create meaning from what you heard, and search your memory for a response, processes that only human beings can perform. With this in mind, you can see that the brain has incredible abilities. 4. Believe that there is no failure, only feedback. People tend to focus on what went wrong even though there were several great things that the memory had performed that day. So as much as possible, focus on your strengths and think of negative feedback as a means to improve yourself. 5. Accept that you don't know everything. When people believe that they know everything, they are actually blocking themselves from receiving new information. Thus, Once you accept the fact that you don't know everything, you will develop an open mind and will begin to welcome new information. To conclude this chapter, the author shares that taking action requires you to identify the beliefs that cause you to limit yourself from all the possibilities. Once you've identified these beliefs, question them and think of ways for it to improve your memory. After all, only you have the power to change your beliefs, especially if you don't like them. Be here now. We live in a world that's full of distractions, making it a challenge to stay focused on one thing. However, what we don't know is that great memory masters become who they are because they have mastered the art of perfect concentration. In order to improve our concentration, we must eliminate conflict as much as possible. According to the author, there are four areas that we need to focus on in order to create peace and eliminate conflict. These are the following. 1. Control your inner voice. We all have a little voice inside our heads which greatly influences our concentration and is responsible for making sense of everything around you. If your inner voice feeds you with negative thoughts, then it limits how you live your life. Thus, you must take charge of your inner voice and focus on the positive things so that you may eventually improve your concentration. 2. Stop multitasking. Contrary to popular belief, multitasking is counterproductive. Multitasking has only earned a good reputation because it makes you think that you are becoming more productive. However, it is all an illusion, a myth that's causing our brains to develop an attention deficit. This is also the reason why a lot of people cannot focus on one task for an extended period of time. To bolster this point, the author shares that according to Marilee Springer, a neuroscience consultant, multitasking can slow people down by 50%. Research likewise reveals that multitasking can make people less productive, less creative, and can lead them to make bad decisions. In order to overcome multitasking, you should consciously and continually stop changing the channels in your mind. Try to commit yourself to one activity at a time. 3. Know what you want. The author shares that most of the time, people who receive information don't really know what they want out of it. To guide us and make the most out of what we want out of information, we have to create PIC, Purpose, Interest, Curiosity, in our minds. Having a purpose means sticking to the reason why you want to learn. However, such purpose must be specific so that you know exactly what to get out of it. For example, Instead of saying that you want to improve your memory, say that you want to learn six or more memory improvement strategies. Once you have created a clear purpose in your mind, you will experience increased attention, comprehension, and retention, all of which will also help you in organizing your thoughts. The author also emphasized the importance of having interest in what you are trying to learn because it helps you focus your attention. Learning is also a lot easier if you are truly interested in what you are reading because your mind never wanders off. And finally, the author shares that you should spark your curiosity before you start learning. The author shares that asking yourself motivational questions before studying not only helps you to focus, but also helps you to enjoy the learning process. Sample questions include, how will this information help me with my goals? Or, how is this relevant to my life? 4. Eliminate worry. Worrying only causes your mind to be filled with various thoughts which send stress emotions throughout your system. 
We cultivate these thoughts whenever we entertain what-if questions like, what if I lose my job, or what if I fail? Thus, the key to living a peaceful and conflict-free life is to ignore these what-ifs and focus on being in your own mind. Create and connect. Bring information to life. When we think of people with great memory, we often associate it with people who were born with photographic memory. These people would simply glance over something and remember it in detail as if their mind turned into a camera to take a picture of it. However, photographic memory is merely a myth. The author shares that memory has something to do with the mind's creative process and not an entirely photographic process. In other words, Great memory results from developing a skill and not a special gift. There are instances when we read a page and by the time we get to the bottom, we have no idea what we just read. The author explains that this happens when we fail to get creative while reading. We fail to bring the information to life. Although we also try to picture out images of what we read from textbooks, the creative process isn't the same as when we're reading novels. When we're reading stories, we imagine it in a way as if a movie playing in our heads. On the other hand, when we're reading a textbook, we only try to have a mental photograph of the text, leaving much of the creative process out of it. But for people who claim to have photographic memory, the creative process is the same for both learning materials. Thus, we now realize that creativity has something to do with how great our memory can be. The author refers to this creative process as the memory imagination system, and we can enhance this system through the C principle. The C principle stands for senses, exaggeration, and energize. The author explains this principle below. Senses. Our brain relies on our five senses to be aware of what's going on around us. When we fully utilize our senses, we not only get to experience more of life, but we also remember more of what we experienced. According to the author, we can train our senses to help us recreate scenarios, meaning we also use our brain more often. And when we use our brain more often, memory improvement follows. Exaggeration. Things which are out of the ordinary are the ones which usually catch our attention. Similarly, we remember more about an exaggerated story than a seemingly day-to-day experience. Thus, the author recommends that we incorporate humorous exaggerations as we can remember the information better. After all, no one ever said that the learning process should be serious. Energize. This aspect of the C principle simply means giving action to your pictures. Between slideshows and movies, we prefer watching the latter because it is more interesting. As much as possible, we must strive to make the information more vivid and appealing. Learning and imagination should always go hand in hand. Whatever we are studying, whether it is by means of reading, watching, or listening, try to incorporate the C principles and imagine the information coming to life. Nonetheless, the author also recognizes that some abstract information may seem hard to transform into images. To remedy this situation, the author recommends associating meaningful thoughts or words to this abstract information. It may be something which sounds the same or something which is also spelled the same way. To illustrate, the author encourages us to imagine washing a tin when we think of Washington or imagine hydrant drinking gin for hydrogen. With this technique in mind, even the most complex information can become interesting and memorable. Having a powerful memory is not a special gift that only a limited number of individuals possess. It is something that we are all born with, but we must make an effort in order to unleash its full potential. Use your car to remember. In the previous chapter, we learned how making mind movies can make information more interesting. In this chapter, the author teaches us a method which helps us create memory files to help us remember information better, a method he refers to as the car method. To help us understand the method better, The author will provide us with an activity, but before we begin, he emphasizes the need to let go of our excuses and try to incorporate the C principles as we progress with the activity. He also reminds us to keep an open mind and remember that words in different languages are merely pictures drawn with letters. Think of your car. Imagine squeezing a large apple into the car's front grid. Then stab a carrot into the bonnet. 
You then visualize a grainy bread on your windshield and think about how it's going to damage your wipers. You enter your car and crush dried fruit on your dashboard. You watch as the crushed pieces of dried fruit go into your speedometer. You sit on the driver's seat and feel sitting on top of blueberries and strawberries. You glance to the passenger seat and throw eggs at the person sitting next to you. Imagine them having egg on their face. You glance over to the back seat and pour thousands of nuts and seeds into it. After you've finished pouring the seeds and nuts, you exit the car and notice a massive orange perched on the car's roof. You head to the boot, open it, and see that it is full of fish. The smell of fish is overpowering. You look at the exhaust pipe and see that there is broccoli and Brussels sprouts growing out of it. Finally, you notice that your tires are made out of sweet potato. Now try to go through the images from beginning to end. If you missed an item or two, try to go back and refresh your memory. This time, make sure to use your imagination and the C principle in order to make a connection. At this point, you are now wondering why the author picked those food items. According to the author, the items placed in the different parts of the car are referred to as the 14 superfoods, foods which improve our vitality and mental agility and alertness. From this, we can see that using the car method can help us memorize various items in an interesting and less repetitive way. To explain why this system works well, he makes us imagine two scenarios. In the first scenario, he makes us imagine throwing water into a filter where water only passes through. In the second scenario, we put a packet into the filter so the water goes through and eventually gets trapped in the packet. According to the author, this second scenario is similar to how our long-term memory works. He explains that our memory has a packet which can be used to store short-term information which the author refers to as medium-term memory, MTM. On the other hand, your long-term memory, LTM, is like a packet where you can store your short-term memories, STM, into, like the compartments of your car. It is also worth noting that organizing information into compartments makes it easier to find. When we continuously organize every bit of information that we encounter, we develop superior thought organization, and with superior thought organization, we also develop accelerated learning. The car method is a fun way to help us recall and organize information. Although the examples used in the book were food items, this doesn't mean that you can't use phrases or other abstract information. As long as you are capable of imagining and associating words or phrases with the new information, then compartmentalizing the information in your car or any form of transportation will be a breeze. Use your body to remember. Now that we have learned the car method, the author now directs us to learn another memory system with the help of our own bodies, a system which he refers to as the body method. The author shares that the body method works in basically the same way as the car method, but this time we'll be using parts of our body which we're all familiar with. In this chapter, we will use this method to learn the 10 intelligences according to Head First by Tony Buzan. We begin this activity by imagining that you are standing on a big bright light bulb, so bright that it is burning your feet. This represents the first intelligence, which is creative intelligence. In your knees, you imagine storing a purse, which sounds like the word personal, and make sure that you completely own the purse on your knees. This represents personal intelligence, which is all about taking responsibility. You now move on to your thighs, where you imagine having a big party on. This represents the third intelligence, which is social intelligence. In your hips or belt, imagine having an angel on your belt buckle. The author associates this with spiritual intelligence because angels tend to remind him of spirituality. In your stomach, imagine yourself getting physical and doing sit-ups to sculpt it into the perfect six-pack. This represents your physical intelligence. In your left hand, imagine holding your nose, ears, and eyes all of which remind you of your senses. Appropriately, your left hand represents your sensual intelligence. On your right hand, you try to imagine any picture that will remind you of your sexual intelligence. We now move on to your face. In your mouth, imagine colorful numbers flying out of your mind to represent your numerical intelligence. On your nose and forehead, you imagine a spaceship landing. 
Don't hesitate to let your imagination run wild on this one. This will represent your spatial intelligence. And finally, imagine the hair on your head writing down words. This represents your verbal intelligence. Now try to recall the ten intelligence in the same order. Just like in the car method, repeat from the beginning if you missed an item or two. The order is important because it also represents a categorization of these intelligences. Your creative and emotional intelligences are those from your feet to your hips. Your bodily intelligences are those on your torso, while your traditional IQ intelligences are those located on your head. With this example, we can now see how the body method can help us store and organize information better. In fact, the author shares that he can store up to around 50 bits of information with this method. To conclude, the author shares that the body method had already been used by the ancient Greeks, which just shows how timeless this method can be. This can be an effective system for you to remember information like shopping lists or work tasks. Of course, make sure to use the C principle to help your imagination run wild. Pegging information down. The author shares that we have a built-in reminder principle which helps us associate a certain item with a specific experience. This reminder principle inspired another memory system known as the PEG method of memory. With this method, you can try to imagine having clothes pegs hanging in your mind where information is left hanging. Additionally, this system is further divided into two PEG methods of memory, namely the rhyming PEG method and the shape PEG method. In the first method, we create memory pegs containing rhyming words, which we will also use as mental files. To help us visualize this example, the author will show us how we can learn the 10 emotions as discussed in the book, Awaken the Giant Within, by Anthony Robin. Before beginning this activity, think of the following rhyming words, one and bun, two and shoe, three and tree, four and door, five and hive, six and sticks, seven and heaven, eight and gate, nine and vine, and ten and hen. We then try to associate each of the ten emotions with a pair of these rhyming words. The associations which the author came up with are as follows. One bun is love and warmth, which we will associate with a warm heart-shaped bun. Two shoe is appreciation and gratitude, which we will associate with a preacher grating a shoe with a cheese grater. Three tree is curiosity. Try to imagine a cat in the tree. According to the author, he always thinks of cats when the word curiosity comes up because of the saying, curiosity killed the cat. Four door is excitement and passion. Imagine an excited person bashing on your door or imagine a door jumping up and down in excitement. Five hive is determination. Imagine a determined group of bees entering their hive. Six sticks is flexibility. Imagine yourself holding a stick and feeling how flexible it can be as you try to bend it in different ways. Seven heaven is confidence. Imagine that heaven is filled with confident people. Really see and feel that people all around are walking tall and filled with confidence. Eight gate is cheerfulness. Think of a gate with a smiley face or that you are cheerfully opening the gate. Nine vine is vitality so you imagine vitamins growing on a vine. And finally, ten hen is contribution. Try to visualize that a generous hen is giving you gifts. The secret to mastering the rhyme method is to really let your imagination run wild, but also make sure that each picture is clear and linked to each pair of words. You should also try to recall everything from 1 to 10 and 10 to 1 to guarantee success. Second peg memory method, the shape system, we try to convert numbers into shapes. The concept of memory is similar to the rhyming list, but instead of a new set of words, the number itself will be represented by objects of similar shapes. To illustrate, the author shares the following example. Zero is represented by a soccer ball. One by a straight pencil. Two by a duck. Three by a camel whose humps form a three. 4. By the sails of a boat. 5. By a five-shaped snake. 6. By an elephant whose trunk forms a six. 7. By a fishing rod. 8. By a snowman. 
and 9 by a balloon whose string forms a 9. Remember that the words and associations made in this chapter merely serve as a guide to help you understand the concepts. You are free to let your imagination run wild as you create your own associations. And once you have mastered the use of these pegging methods, the possibilities become endless. In the first place, the next system we are to learn has already been in existence for more than 2,500 years. But although it has been around for that long, only a few were able to use it. The author shares that this system has the same process as the car method and the body method, but he considers this as the most incredible tool that we can learn. In this method, we will be using places, location markers, or routes to store information in. The author summarized the process as follows. 1. Visualize and prepare an organized location in your mind. It can either be the layout of your own home, the supermarket, or the places you normally pass through on your journey to work. 2. Create markers on your visualized location. Make sure that these markers are in an easy-to-follow order. 3. Clearly imagine, using the C principle, the information you wish to remember. And 4. Place each image of the information in each marker. In other words, this system would require you to visualize a place where you can store your information. The author shares that this can help you store large bits of information in an easy way since it would be like remembering your trip to the nearest store. The author refers to this method as the journey method and to help us visualize how it works, he shares another activity with us. For this activity, the author teaches us how we can remember the 12 principles laid down in the Daily Dozen by John C. Maxwell. These 12 principles are attitude, priorities, health, family, thinking, commitment, finances, faith, relationships, generosity, values, and growth. To begin with our exercise, let us first create a mental map of our house and identify the 12 places where this information will be stored in. As an example, the author shares the following mental map. Room 1 is the kitchen, where he will use the washing machine, fridge, and stove. Room 2 is the television room, where he will use the chairs, TV, and exercise bike. Room 3 is the bedroom, where he will use the mirror, cupboards, and bed. Room 4 is the bathroom, where he will use the bath, shower, and toilet. Now we move on to the fun part and use the C principle. We start with the kitchen where we imagine a person with a bad attitude jumping into your washing machine. You head to the machine and clean up his attitude. You now move to the next place, the fridge, where you write down all your priorities on the door. Visualize yourself using permanent markers as you write so that your priorities listed are permanently written on the fridge. A healthy bodybuilder has now entered your kitchen and you watch as he makes a hearty apple pie and shoves it into the stove. At this point, try to recall each principle starting from what's in the washing machine. You now enter the TV room. Visualize your entire family jumping up and down on the chairs. You glance over to your TV and imagine a thought bubble coming out of it. The author explains that you can imagine either that the TV is a thinking machine or or is one which influences the way we think. You then go to your exercise bike and commit to using it. As you enter the bedroom, the first thing you notice is your mirror. Money is flying out of it. To help us remember this better, the author says that he used this because our finances are a reflection of how productive we are. You now open your cupboard and store an item in each shelf. You are free to imagine what this item is as long as it represents faith for you. On the bed, you visualize something which would represent relationships for you. You now enter the final room, your bathroom. You visualize a genie jumping out of the bath, and he declares that he will grant you what you wish. This genie represents generosity. You glance over your shower and notice that it is made of gold. According to the author, this represents value because gold has great value. And finally, You look at the toilet and see a tree growing out of it, representing the final principle, growth. At this point, ask yourself if you are able to recall each principle connected to each place. If you are able to connect each item with each principle in an orderly way, then recall will not be a problem. With this system in mind, you are also unlocking the possibility of having unlimited memory. 
The author encourages us to practice using this method whenever we have to learn lengthy information. To guarantee success, he advises that we use a location that we're really familiar with because it will be easier to remember. The best part about the journey method is that it makes you realize how limitless your memory can be. Think about it. We have a vast option of journeys or places, and each place has hundreds of available items which you can associate with your information. The author also shares that memory masters use this method more than any other method, thus bolstering how effective it can be. Nonetheless, we do not perfect this system overnight. It takes patience and constant practice to become a great memory master. But most importantly, we must not forget to have fun while learning. Linking Thoughts At this point, we are ready to link thoughts together. The author believes that linking our thoughts is an effective way of strengthening both our imagination and our ability to associate concepts. In other words, we have to associate old information with new information in order to learn. Before the author explains the system which would help us associate items better, he first shares a story with us. He reiterates that the story will seem silly at first, but everything will fall into place as we get to the end. He also reminds us to use the C principle as we read through the story. The story begins with the author asking us to imagine washing a tin. Make sure that the image is visually clear in your mind. While washing, the tin develops a large Adam's apple. You then see a chef and her son rip the Adam's apple out. After that, the chef and her son made some medicine which they gave to Marilyn Monroe, who in turn also develops a large Adam's apple. Michael Jackson sees the Adam's apple and jumps into the van with beer in it. You look at the van and notice that it is being driven by a hairy son that eventually crashes it into a tiler who is busy tiling his wall with polka dot tiles. A tailor then takes one of the dots off and makes you a polka dot suit. Now try to recall the story, reread it, and make sure to strengthen the link between thoughts. Also, try to see if you can recall the story starting from the end. Can you recall everything? Congratulations! You have just learned the first 12 presidents of the United States of America. Washington 10 is Washington. Adam's apple is Adams. Chef and her son is Jefferson. Medicine is Madison. Marilyn Monroe is Monroe. Adam's apple is Adams. Michael Jackson is Jackson. Van with a beer in it is Van Buren. Harry's son is Harrison. Tyler is Tyler. Polka Dots is Polk. And Taylor is Taylor. To give us an additional challenge, the author encourages us to continue this list using our own set of linking thoughts. Just make sure that you can clearly visualize each of them for better retention. Through this method, you can potentially recall thousands of concepts by simply writing a mental story. As long as we max out our creativity and imagination, we can surely come up with a story that sparks our interest and curiosity, thereby also improving our memory. Additionally, this method is not just limited to words or simple concepts. The author also encourages us to use this to memorize long paragraphs of information. This method is especially recommended for students who are made to study large volumes of information in a short span of time. Remembering Names Being the social beings that we are, it is inevitable for us to make friends and acquaintances as we get going on our life's journey. The problem, however, lies in the fact that we don't always recall everyone we meet, especially if we only spend a few minutes with them. When this happens, we often blame our bad memory. However, the author points out that it is our memory strategy that's to blame and not our memory. In this chapter, the author discusses methods which will help us recall names better and in a more interesting way. Before beginning with his discussion, the author reminds us to get rid of self-limiting beliefs about our memory. He keeps emphasizing the importance of keeping an open mind and staying interested in the names that you wish to learn. Like the previous methods taught in this book, the strategy in this chapter will require us to use our associating mind. It may seem quite challenging at first, but nothing is impossible if we know how to persevere. With that said, the author shares that the secret to remembering names, like a memory champion, is to focus on the four C's, concentrate, create, connect, and continuous use. 1. Concentrate. 
When people are first being introduced, they often say their name so quickly that the tendency for those on the receiving end is to miss it. And technically, you can't forget something that you never knew in the first place. To avoid a similar mishap, the author suggests that we be more alert during these instances. In order to concentrate on what a person's name is, we should be genuinely interested in it. When we become interested in learning a person's name, our ability to listen is also heightened. Thus, we get a better chance of catching their name. 2. Create Another tip that the author shares with us is to create an image of the name in our mind. You are free to get creative on the imagery as long as you can clearly visualize it in your mind and that you are able to associate it with that person. An example is Cave In, Horse and Bruce Lee for the author's name, Kevin Horsley. Additionally, the author shares that we only have 20 seconds before we completely forget the person's name. Thus, we must be able to visualize and associate the image with the person's name within the 20-second period. 3. Connect As previously discussed, learning is a process wherein we forge a relationship between old information and new information. Since humans are better at remembering faces than names, there is a need for us to connect the known image of the face with the unknown name. There are various methods in order for us to make the connection. The author shares them as follows. The first method is the comparison connection, in which we try to associate the person's name to a name that we already know. For example, if the person's name is George, try to think of an other person who has the same name. It may be anyone close to you, or they can even be a celebrity. Now that you've associated the name, think of a physical feature that both of them have. The author shares that paying attention to a person's feature makes us more attentive, therefore also creating a lasting impression in our minds. Another method is face connection. We are often drawn to a person's unique facial feature, so we should use that attentiveness in order to remember the person's name. The author provides us an example to illustrate this method. Suppose that you have been introduced to a person with beautiful blue eyes who tells you that her name is Janice. Since Janice sounds like chain ice, you can associate the name with a facial feature by imagining a chain of ice flying out of her blue eyes. The best thing about this method is that it also applies if you meet several people at the same time. Focusing on their outstanding features while creating an image of their names in your mind greatly boosts your attentiveness. And as discussed, increased attentiveness nudges our long-term memory. The final method is meeting location connection. The author shares that when we meet people for the first time, we also remember the place where we met them. Again, we make a connection between the old information with the new one. We connect the familiar place with the unfamiliar name. The author suggests using the journey peg method for better association. 4. Continuous Use The three previous tips will help you remember names for short or medium terms. To guarantee the success in long-term memory, you must continuously use and associate the name with the person. This is especially helpful if you are trying to remember foreign-sounding or unique names. Remembering Numbers A majority of us would agree that remembering numbers is a big challenge. Not only does it feel burdensome, but the whole memorizing process can also be boring. Fortunately, there is a system that can help us recall numbers better, and it's all discussed in this chapter. Memory masters use various methods to help them remember numbers better. The method which we will be discussing in this chapter is the one he believes is the most effective and one which is used by a majority of memory masters. The method he is referring to is one wherein we transform numbers into words and images which are easier to remember. According to the author, it will be like creating our own language because we have come up with our own interesting code for each number. In this way, both our numerical and verbal intelligence are exercised at the same time. By way of example, the author shares that he made a code where each number corresponded with a letter in the alphabet. Some of the associations he made were 0 for S, 1 for T, and 8 for F. He used these pairings to remember dates like 1801 when the first submarine was built. He imagined the submarine being built really fast with 801 forming FST. Nonetheless, the author recognizes that it will not be easy at first. 
You have to work hard and constantly practice in order to perfect your word and number pairings. You are creating and learning a brand new language after all. Keep in mind that we all develop our skills through constant practice and perseverance. Once we have perfected this method, the possibilities can be limitless. Art in Memory At this point, we are now acquainted with various methods and systems which can help us maximize how we use our memory. So in this chapter, the author will show us how we can turn information into art. Keep in mind that the more we use our creativity, the more we also use our memory. Thus, this is an essential step since it makes the information catch our attention, which in turn also makes it last longer in our memory. For this activity, you can choose whatever means that you have available. It can be as simple as pen and paper or as digitally advanced as a virtual illustrator. Once you have your tools, you can now create memory diagrams, which you can view often to help you refresh your memory. According to the author, this will help us in various ways and can even be taught to children to help them improve their spelling. For example, you can show them a picture of a bowl of ice cream with two S-shaped snakes on top of two scoops. This will help them visualize and recall that dessert is spelled with SS as opposed to desert. Of course, you can use this method to recall more complex information like the periodic table or the 12 cranial nerves in our body. Again, the author reiterates that the secret to making sure that you recall every bit of information is to be creative with your imaginations. Another way to help our brains get creative is through mind mapping. Mind mapping, a registered trademark by Tony Bazan, is a method used through which we visualize all information being linked together by one central system in our brain. This makes our thoughts and ideas more organized, which also paves the way for easier recall. And the best part about mind mapping is that it is not just limited to helping us memorize lessons and concepts, but it can also help us with learning, planning, organizing, and other forms of thinking. In the words of Tony Buzan himself, it's like your mind's own Swiss knife. Getting started with mind mapping will only require your brain, a piece of paper, and colored pens or pencils. To illustrate this concept, the author will lay down the steps in creating a mind map. In this example, he will guide us in creating a map out of the systems discussed in this book. The following are the steps in creating a mind map. 1. Start at the center of a blank piece of paper and draw a central image. Since we are going to make a map out of the systems we have learned in this book, write systems at the heart of your central image. 2. Draw branches from your central image which will represent each of the memory systems we have covered. 3. From these main branches, we can draw a second level of branches which will represent the concepts within each memory system. You are free to add as many third or fourth level branches into your mind map to make it as precise as possible. However, make sure that each branch will be represented by only one word, the most relevant to the concept to make it easier to recall. With mind mapping, as with all other methods, practice is key. Fortunately, we now live in a digital age in which digital versions are easily accessible to help us create mind maps in a fun and interactive way. Using the methods At this point, we already know the fundamentals of each memory method. Thus, it is now incumbent upon the author to present us with ways in order to maximize our own use of these methods. The following are the ways which can help us adapt the methods and unleash our limitless memory. 1. In remembering information verbatim, you have to find keywords in each phrase which can easily be linked to the next keyword, all of which can help you remember the rest of the text. Start by practicing with short poems and make sure to imagine each image vividly so that it really sticks to your memory. 2. Whenever we have to present information from memory, our biggest concern is to black out in front of the audience and eventually fail at our presentation. The author suggests that in order to succeed at presenting information from memory, we must create a structured and organized system of information in our minds. Make sure that you can clearly visualize these concepts in your mind. This will help you to stay focused on your presentation, thereby also reducing the chances of succumbing to stage fright. 3. Being absent-minded is something we are all familiar with. Unfortunately, we often associate it with having bad memory. The author shares that in reality, 
We're only absent-minded for 5% of the time, but this is what our brain notices instead of the 95% of the time we get things right. In order to fight this negative concept, try to be more focused on the moment. Recognize each moment, whether positive or negative, and make sure to live by it. In this way, you will come to realize that you're not as absent-minded as you thought you were. 4. Remembering a shuffled pack of cards can also be quite tricky. According to the author, an average person can remember about half of the pack in 30 minutes. Memory masters, on the other hand, can remember a shuffled pack of cards within seconds. The secret to this is to use the memory methods and give life to each card on the deck. There are 52 cards, so each of them must have a unique imagery in your mind. In effect, as soon as you see the shuffled cards, you can easily associate it with the images you've created. Nonetheless, this takes a lot of practice before you can memorize the deck within seconds. 5. The thought of studying anything seems impossible. The author, however, believes that our memory has the capacity to learn anything as long as we utilize the memory methods. Research reveals that students who perform better at school are the ones who study small bits every day and are less likely to cram on the day of the exam. With this, the author says that learning is a continuous process which requires proper planning and organization. Specifically, the author emphasizes the need to have a strong PIC, purpose, interest, curiosity, in our minds. And once we do, we will unlock the potential for limitless memory and learning. Continuous Use Self-Discipline All these methods, systems, and tips will be meaningless if we do not have self-discipline. Come to think of it, people often associate a person's success to them possessing a unique ability. But in reality, a person's success is a result of hard work, dedication, and discipline. With that said, the author highlights the importance of developing self-discipline. Unfortunately, We often associate self-discipline with self-deprivation, which should not be the case. To help us develop self-discipline, the author lays down the following tips. 1. Create a vision. We may not realize it yet, but our vision and energy are connected. If we focus on bad things as soon as we wake up, then our energy levels will be low. But if you open up to the possibilities first thing in the morning, then your energy levels are at peak throughout the day. In terms of discipline, creating a vision simply means remembering what you want out of life and focusing on that to help you stay positive all day. 2. Make a decision. Keep in mind that change only happens if we make a decision to actually make a change. But more than making a decision, you have to really commit to that change. 3. As much as possible, don't listen to your feelings. Sometimes our feelings limit our actions depending on whether we're comfortable with doing it or not. When we encounter situations like these, the author encourages readers to do so anyway because we have full control of our life and not our emotions. 4. Finally, the final tip is to make sure that you conduct memory training on a daily basis. The memory methods discussed in this book provide us with means for better recall for short and medium terms, but long-term memory requires constant and committed training. Thus, there is a constant need for us to review these methods. More on this will be discussed in the next chapter. Review to Renew The author shares that, on average, a person only remembers three weeks' worth of lessons after two years from graduating. In fact, an experiment conducted by Spritzer revealed that an average person remembers only 54% of what he has learned the day before and in a span of 28 days, he is only left with 18% of what he has learned. When we consider the numbers, this will make learning seem like a waste of time and effort. Fortunately, there is a way to help to retain all the information we come across through the process of review. The author acknowledges that the memory methods and systems previously discussed will help us remember information in an enjoyable way, while reviewing helps the information keep a solid footing in your memory. Thus, memory methods help you retain information within medium terms, while review helps it stick for long-term recall. The following are the author's suggested review strategies. Since memory methods help us simplify the review process, think of it as playing a game while also learning along the way. In this way, 
we no longer have to go through the boring repetitive methods which we used to do at school. Review only involves a simple process of thinking about the information and then clearly visualizing the associated images to make them as vivid as we can make them to be. After visualization, the author also suggests reciting the information to make sure that it really sticks. The author has discovered that reviewing the information within a specified time can greatly improve your recall. He shares that if we repeat what we've studied within 10 minutes after learning them, then there's a great probability that we will be able to retain the information for at least an hour. Finally, the author suggests that throughout the review process, we must also try to review each piece of information backwards. He shares that if we review images backwards and gain mastery of the succession of images, then the result is more effective recall. Reviewing is a process which helps us retain the information in our minds but reviewing information is easier said than done. Thus, the author emphasized the need to cultivate self-discipline and to keep us going throughout the unlimited memory journey. He also reminds us to keep a clear image of our goals at all times. In this way, we remain motivated and disciplined regardless of what our feelings are trying to say. We are in control of our life after all. The thought of possessing unlimited memory seems like something only a superhuman is blessed with. From the time we started school, we have always been made to think that learning can only be achieved in a certain way by boring repetition. Fortunately, we can train our memory in order to unlock its full potential, and the author lays down the most effective memory methods and systems in this book. Before diving into discussing the various memory methods, the author finds it incumbent to brief us about what we are about to learn. He shares that we must first develop our concentration before trying any of these methods, and to develop it, we need to stop making excuses, let go of our negative beliefs about our memory, and to focus on the present. He explains that our excuses only hinder us from taking the first step towards success. On the other hand, he discusses that our false beliefs about memory only cause us to limit its abilities And when we limit our memory, we also limit ourselves. And finally, failure to focus on the present only causes us to be less productive. Contrary to popular belief, multitasking does not make us productive. In fact, it makes us lose our focus since our mind is clouded by all of the things we have to do within a span of time. With that said, the author moves on to discuss the importance of visualization. He introduces us to the C principle which stands for senses, exaggeration, and energize. According to this principle, whenever we are trying to learn new information, we must always be as creative as possible. To be creative, we must maximize the use of our senses, exaggerate the imagery to make it more interesting, and energize the picture by giving it action. The importance of learning the C principle lies in the fact that it is at the heart of every memory method. The first memory method is the car method, wherein we are taught to store our learnings into various compartments in our car. The second memory method, the body method, works in the same way, but instead of organizing information into your car, you try to store each bit of information in the various parts of your body. The third method is the pegging method of memory, wherein you are made to imagine your thoughts being pegged into your mind, similar to how clothes pegs work. This method is further subdivided into the rhyming peg method and the shape system, wherein we associate our learnings with rhyming words or shapes respectively. Another memory method is the journey method, which, according to the author, is the best memory method he has ever used. He shares that this is an effective method since it has the ability to potentially save limitless information. It works by associating information with a familiar place or journey that we normally take, so that we get the chance to review the information every time we are at that location. Of course, we are not limited to using these methods and systems to remember concepts and lessons. We can also use them to remember names, numbers, and so much more. Nonetheless, these methods can only help us improve our medium-term memory. In order to guarantee that the information will permanently be in our minds, we must not forget to review everything we've learned. It doesn't have to be boring and repetitive. As long as we do not let go of our creativity, then we are certainly on the path towards unlimited memory.